Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is the sixth such webinar that Pallium is hosting on topics relevant to healthcare teams who are actively leading the response to COVID-19. My name is Jeffrey Mote. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada, and today's webinar is focused on the palliative care approach in the coronavirus pandemic. And as with previous webinars, we've assembled a group of experts country, all of whom are palliative care physicians, and each presenter will be taking us through a series of slides. Um, in terms of some housekeeping items, uh, everyone's microphones are muted. Uh, we would like to solicit your input and your questions throughout the webinar, and you can do that by scrolling over the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen, uh, and by contributing in this fashion, you're helping to the collection of knowledge uh, that everyone can benefit from, so thank you in advance for doing that. And we're going to be collecting and collating all this information uh, for future reference, and it's going to be sent out along with a copy of the TAKE webinar. So uh, next slide. Uh, so I've introduced myself. I'll now turn it over to our moderator and presenters to introduce themselves. So uh, Denise, over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's um, a pleasure for me to be moderating this um, webinar on behalf of Pallium Scientific Director, Dr. Jose Pereira. And um, yeah, we have a couple of uh, uh, knowledgeable and great uh, panelists today. I am the medical director of McNally House Hospice in Niagara in Ontario, and um, also medical director of the Niagara West Palliative Care Team and a professor of palliative medicine at McMaster University. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Pippa Hawley, who's Medical Director, Pain and Symptom Management, Palliative Care Program, BC Cancer, and also Head of UBC Division of Palliative Care. And along with uh, Dr. Hawley today is Dr. David Williscroft, who's Clinical Associate Professor, Department of Emergency Medicine and Division of Palliative Care at UBC. And as you can see from Dr. Williscroft, um, working on the front line. So I will be helping to moderate and bring your questions forward. Um, first of all, declaration of, of conflict of interest. As, as I hope we know, Pallium Canada is a not-for-profit agency funded mostly by Health Canada in the form of contribution to programs and generates funds to support operations in R&D from course registrations and sale of the Pallium pocketbook. I, um, I know that I have received in the past honorariums from Pallium Canada, not for this presentation. And I believe Dr. Hollies expressed a, a past a declaration of receiving Pallium um, honorariums. And Dr. Williscroft, I don't know if you have any conflict of interest to declare. Uh, nothing for this talk, but I have facilitated for Pallium courses in the past. Fair enough. And as the, as the CEO, I should mention that, of course, I'm paid by the organization. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. So the learning objectives today, folks, is, is to look specifically at managing symptoms in COVID-19. We're going to be focusing on that as well as palliative sedation and the last days and hours. Please note, there are a plethora of pallium webinars, in fact, and one will be devoted to management of dyspnea. It's been covered in a separate pallium webinar. That will, will not be the focus of today's. We hope that uh, folks listening are our intended audience, and that is family physicians, nurse practitioners in particular. It, this is not geared toward palliative medicine specialists. Um, you're welcome to be part of this, but, if, but, uh, but our content is geared toward family physicians and nurse practitioners. I'm going to turn at this point the slide deck over to Dr. Pippa Hawley, who will lead us through this um, body of information. Dr. Hawley? Yep, thank you. Um, that's great. Thanks, Denise. And I apologize to the rest of the team for being a bit late logging on. I hope I didn't panic you at the last minute. Um, so uh, many of you that are participating in this webinar will feel like they have a pretty good understanding of of palliative care. But I think I wanted to start off initially just making sure that people are aware that modern palliative care is quite different to how palliative care was perceived even up until quite recently. Um, the WHO definition did change a few years ago, um, just in some subtle ways, uh, but subtle, it's subtle but important. Uh, the, the, I've, um, I've written up here the definition of, the, um, of palliative care according to the WHO. There's actually two slides, there's part one and part two. And the, um, the coloured and the italicised part is, uh, is my words. If you could just go, go back one slide. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So the, the concept now is that palliative care is an approach. It's not a service. So palliative, if palliative care can be delivered by anybody. And in fact, the vast majority of palliative care is delivered by non-specialists. 
Um, the focus, as I think everybody knows, is the quality of life of patients, but including their families, not just the patients. And one of the biggest changes with the new definition with this, with this life threatening illness rather than life limiting. So now for somebody to be eligible for a palliative approach to care, there only has to be the possibility that they might die of an illness, not that they will definitely. And I think this is, this is an important concept to get across, particularly when we're dealing with a pandemic where we don't know who's going to live and who's going to die from it at the beginning. Though we do have increased risk factors for, uh, for dying from the, uh, the virus, rather than just increasing your risk of getting it. Uh, at the end of the day, we've got, got like 101 year old people that are surviving infection and um, doing very well. And we've got completely healthy young people who are also dying. So this, this concept of being life threatening and at risk of dying is really key to uh, identifying when people have palliative care needs. You don't have to be waiting until someone's certain to be dying. Prevention and relief of suffering, I think, is fairly clear. But I think prevention is one of the reasons why we're here and trying to do this, um, in that we don't want people to be being reactive to suffering. We want people to be anticipating what might happen um, and trying to identify it early, think what could be a problem, and be ready to address it rather than waiting and going, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Um, and then the, the last part of the slide is that's physical, social, psychological, spiritual. We're not just talking about how to prescribe opioids and it's not just hand-holding. Uh, good palliative care is a, a multi-faceted, multidisciplinary activity with its own knowledge base. And uh, there is quite a lot of content to know there. It's not just enough to, to want to do a good job. You have to actually have content expertise as well. Um, and the last point here to emphasize is that you can have good palliative care in conjunction with treatments that may get you through a, an illness um, like COVID-19 or certainly uh, any other illness that m would be intended to prolong life. And we have, we have to remember that people that are uh, sick at the moment for whatever reason, it's not all from COVID-19. There are still people dying of cancer and from end-stage heart disease and renal failure, et cetera. It's important to recognize that we have to deliver care to all people, not just to people with COVID-19. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So I think we've, the definition covers the uh, the main aims of palliative care, but I think it's it's important just to recognise that, especially if you're thinking, okay, I'm going to see this patient. I think they have palliative care needs. What are the big things that I have to do? And think about it in in three ways. First of all, it's the physical and emotional suffering. So trying to anticipate and prevent. The second part is making sure that communication, goals of care, decisions, um, they're all made in the best possible way, so communication. And then the third part is that extra layer of support for patients and family that makes them feel that the healthcare system and their community is on their side and that they're not alone. Now, normally we have a lot of time to be able to um, get these three pillars of, of palliative care established and to build up the relationships and build up the teams. But the problem is with COVID-19 is we have to really go from zero to 100 in minutes. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, truncated approach. Um, next slide. So this conundrum of uncertainty with whether patients might get better or whether they won't. Uh, things can change very fast. And I, Dave can perhaps speak to this um, after I've finished doing the slides. But um, from what I've heard with um, some of the people, certainly in BC that we've heard about, um, they, they seem to be doing okay. And then all of a sudden they deteriorate really, really quickly. Um, so you have to be prepared. Uh, you may not have time to respond and if you're not anticipating that there could be this rapid deterioration. Um, and the, the, when we're talking about anticipation, we, we can't just be thinking about um, the infection control and we can't just be thinking about life prolonging measures like getting access to ventilators. We have to be meeting the palliative care needs at the same time uh, because many of our patients, if they do deteriorate very quickly, the, uh, the outcome from ventilation is, is really not very good uh, for many of our patients. Next slide. So this is the bow tie model of 21st century palliative care, which um, I designed it around 2013, end of 2013, published in 2014. So hopefully won't be new to many of you, but I've been surprised at how, how slow it is, um, it, it, this concept of um, concurrent um, dual reality of people might get better or they might not um, has been spreading. 
uh, there's still an awful lot of perception that palliative care is only for people who are at the very end stages of life. So this model emphasizes the need to consider survivorship as a possibility, 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 ability, even if considered as a possibility and recognized throughout the course of illness and that palliative care interventions are very much um, appropriate right from the beginning of a chronic disease um, experience. Next slide. Um, again, just uh, emphasizing that um, the process of rehabilitation and survivorship are important just as much as bereavement care, which is part of, of modern palliative care. Next slide. I use this visual model as a, a, a useful tool to actually explain to patients and sometimes to my healthcare colleagues about how a visual model can actually replace a thousand words. Um, if you explain to people at the beginning of their course of illness or even before they become ill, like if there's somebody with high risk of having a bad outcome if they did catch COVID-19, um, or to develop COVID-19. This is something that you can talk to them when they're completely healthy so that you can explain what the process is and that palliative care is important um, to be recognized um, and as part of the approach to care right from the beginning. So it's not meant to be something that sits on the shelf in a textbook. This model is meant to be drawn on the back of a napkin or on a scrap of paper um, or described over the telephone. It's not complicated and uh, it, uh, it really has been a useful tool I've found um, in explaining to people what their future might look like. It's kind of like a journey map for their illness. Next slide. And one of the, uh, the things that we were seeing with new oncology treatments was that, uh, well, and transplants is that people who were expected to die from something would suddenly uh, get a complete change in their, um, in their prospects uh, because of getting better. And this is something that we are seeing a lot in COVID-19 and that people um, can have a, a real reversal of uh, the way that they're looking like they're going to be going, uh, which is unpredictable. Next slide. So again, um, using the vocabulary of palliative care early in the course of illness makes it much less scary because so, people sometimes associate palliative care with giving up or with dying. And the, if you introduce it when somebody is gravely ill, that's not going to be a good time to learn new vocabulary. So try and introduce the concept of a palliative care early on and educate before it becomes personal. Like talk about um, people's relatives um, elderly parents talk about that at the time when you're talking about um, their progressive um, health problems or deciding whether they might need to go into a care home or something like that. Don't wait until it's critical. And when people are, are stressed, you need to use every tool you can to be able to explain complex um, constructs or concepts and um, using words that um, people are not familiar with having to learn a whole new vocabulary uh, will probably mean that the message is lost uh, in the process. Um, so next slide. So in, uh, in COVID-19 uh, it's important that the circumstances are recognized where appropriate interventions uh, for, um, for disease management like trying to reverse the situation by admitting to ICU and ventilation other interventions whether when they're appropriate because there are many people in whom it is entirely appropriate that they have maximum life prolonging efforts um, and then the other situations when the outcome is not likely to be so good and that uh, the the importance of integrating a palliative approach to care early is actually greater than in others next slide so once infected with, uh, with the virus, we, I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware that the majority, over 80% of patients have very mild symptoms. In fact, probably up to half of people don't even know that they have the disease and they're just asymptomatic uh, patients that, uh, that have the, uh, the virus. They may be able to spread it. Uh, they may not have any symptoms at all. Uh, but about 14% develop severe symptoms to the point where they become sick enough and some re require hospitalization. So of those that do become sick enough to require hospitalization. Um, some of them develop respiratory failure, then go on to shock or multiple organ um, system failure. And the case fatality rate is actually extremely hard to determine because we don't really know what the actual number of patients are in various countries where this has been reported actually have the, uh, the illness. 
uh, that it's certainly even in BC, the proportion of patients who've actually been tested who have mild symptoms is extremely low. So all the reported case positive rates are probably you know, by two or three orders of magnitude underestimates of actual infection rates. Um, so the hospitalization rate per head of the population is probably a more important measure of, um, of how much uh, virus there is there. We know that those over the age of 80, they have a 15 to 20 percent uh, chance of dying. Um, and we, uh, when we first learned about this from Wuhan, the first two hospitals that had the majority of patients, they published the results of 191 people who'd been admitted to hospital and 28 percent of them died. So just being admitted to hospital is actually a bad sign. Next slide. If you add up the overall mortality, because it's not just people that live in, that, that go to hospital that, um, that die from this, unfortunately, a large number of people have also died at home. And, and some countries, particularly in China, um, those numbers weren't included in the statistics. And you may have seen today in the news, uh, they've added basically 50% more patients to the death rates that hadn't been previously reported because they, uh, they were ones that had died at home or in long-term care facilities rather than in, um, in hospital. So they were completely missed by the statistics early on. Uh, the 28% the though is not evenly spread and those who are um, older, over 65 does confer an increased risk, but it does go up significantly more as you go older. Uh, those that have diabetes and particularly hypertension seems to be very strongly associated. Um, COPD, cancer, any chronic illness and recent surgery have also been noted to have an increased risk, but it appears that hypertension and cardiovascular disease like stroke or heart attacks uh, in the past are of much higher risk and that may be something to do with the angiotensin converting enzyme binding uh, to the, uh, for the virus to actually get into the system. Um, it seems that some people are genetically more predisposed to um, do worse with this, and that seems to be strongly associated with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's more that than the, um, than the immune suppression that you normally have, which increases people's risk of doing poorly, uh, which you'd see more with cancer. Um, next slide. So of all comers who actually get sick enough to need ventilating, about half of them uh, have been reported to have died. Um, it depends a little bit on uh, how early and how, how proactive uh, a healthcare system is being with ventilators. And I think that uh, it, it seems that uh, the results in North America are being a little bit better, particularly in BC, because of earlier access to ventilation. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the older you are, the worse the risk. And when people were ventilated, the duration of ventilation was 11 to 21 days. But some people were not dying because of um, being um, taken off ventilation. Um, some of them died on the ventilator because of the multiple organ system failure. So even being ventilated, they were unable to be, um, to be kept alive, mostly because of um, acute cardiomyopathy uh, with um, pump failure, needing inotropes, and then arrhythmias. Uh, more uh, next slide. So I, I just put the uh, some references up here. Uh, these are all very recent. These have all been published in the last uh, two months. Uh, for those of you that like to go and look at the primary source of the data that I've just presented. Next slide. So I just wanted to briefly go over the um, symptoms uh, that come up with uh, people who are having. Um, COVID-19 illness, uh, particularly those uh, in whom we're not planning on ventilating. Um, so this, this is nothing to do with uh, the actual management of the, um, the complications of it, uh, where people would consider going to ICU. This is what to do if you have somebody where you don't think it would be appropriate to send them to the ICU. And uh, the four primary symptoms that uh, people are, are reported to suffer from are shortness of breath, uh, anxiety, delirium, and an excess of secretions. And the one-page uh, symptom management guideline that you'll see on the right there, uh, I know that's small, I'm going to take it apart and review each part separately, uh, but it, this is posted on the UBC Division of Palliative Care website, and it will be adapted uh, uh, if needed further as more information comes in. Uh, but um, so far, this is version two and it hasn't changed significantly since uh, probably about three weeks ago. So next slide. 
for shortness of breath, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but um, the, the bottom line basically is opioids, opioids and more opioids. Uh, people with um, COVID-19 associated respiratory distress seem to get very sick very quickly. And the normal escalation schedules that we would think about for cancer pain seem to be wholly inadequate. So yes, you should start with the normal doses that you would give for somebody starting on opioids for pain management, uh, like 2.5 to 5 milligrams orally or uh, a half the dose uh, sub-Q or IV. Um, for hydromorphone, hydromorphone is five times as potent as morphine in the majority of people, though it's not, um, it's not well um, evidenced. Uh, but um, you can use five to one as a reasonable conversion ratio. Um, and start with a small dose, but be prepared to go up quite quickly. And remember that uh, morphine and hydromorphone, by whatever route you give, will only last up to four hours, sometimes less than people who are fast metabolizers. Uh, but um, waiting four hours to increase a dose when somebody is dyspneic after the point where their blood level would be expected to have peaked, um, it's not going to get any better. So you need to be very clear that um, doses can be escalated at relatively short intervals. If you're going parenteral, you can even go up every half hour if it's orally every hour. Um, Thank you. For shortness of breath, um, people that are already taking opioids, uh, you don't want to start with the opioid naive dosing that we just presented. Uh, you want to keep going with the previous opioid, but consider increasing the dose by up to 25% um, and be very um, comfortable using much bigger breakthrough doses. Um, don't, um, don't be too um, nervous about increasing as long as somebody's watching the patient. Um, and they're alert and they're um, orientated and they don't appear to be having any signs of opioid toxicity. Because of the dyspnea, uh, sometimes accelerating very rapidly, you may need to increase the doses quite quickly. Next slide. Um, for um, anxiety, um, delirium, um, and shortness of breath, um, essentially, you, uh, though you have multiple symptoms, you have one root of uh, management, um, and that is to use uh, sedatives. Uh, normally for uh, anxiety, we use the benzodiazepines, but for delirium, we avoid them. Um, on, in this situation, the delirium can become quite severe quite quickly. And uh, though normally we would avoid using benzodiazepines because they can uh, exacerbate delirium in the non-acute setting, um, in this situation, you really are needing to use sedation. So you're, you're sort of managing delirium and palliatively sedating at the same time. Um, so it's, it's okay to use antipsychotics and um, benzodiazepines at the same time. And again, whatever you can get. Um, midazolam is obviously ideal because uh, it can be adjusted uh, very finely with uh, small changes in dosing, having a very rapid onset of effect. But uh, midazolam is quite labor intensive and there may well be a shortage of midazolam. So lorazepam or in fact any other benzodiazepine would be perfectly appropriate. And particularly for agitational restlessness where there is more of a component of delirium um, more, on, more than the anxiety, then an antipsychotic like methotromepazine would be entirely appropriate. If there's a shortage of methotromepazine, you can use chlorpromazine. You can pretty much use any antipsychotic, but the more sedating, the better. Next slide. Secretion management, uh, I actually don't have any personal um, experience with using this um, in the COVID-19 context, and I'm hoping that Dave will be able to help us with that. But I, I think um, even in the non-COVID context, there's not a whole lot of good evidence for using the anti-secretory agents. Glycopyrrolate is thought to be the safest because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But again, glycopyrrolate may be in short supply. So atropine, 1% ophthalmic drops given sublingually are also um, often very helpful. Um, Ferrosamide, if it's thought there's an element of fluid overload may be very helpful. And one of the things that um, the intensivists are, are particularly noticing is that um, with COVID-19 associated respiratory failure, it's very important to avoid overhydration. And so being quite judicious with the fluids, uh, which is, is a little difficult if um, people then get um, pump failure and then need inotropes. Uh, but just to be aware that you don't just routinely uh, whack in a whole load of, of fluids with people with this syndrome. Next slide. So palliative sedation therapy, just some general uh, points here. Uh, the key thing with palliative sedation is that the sedation is proportional 
to the symptom and the dose is adjusted to comfort. So we're, we're not just knocking somebody out. This is not euthanasia. Um, and when death ensues, as long as the sedation has been proportional, the death is due to the disease, not the medication. And outside of the COVID context, it's actually been shown that palliative sedation therapy does not shorten life. In fact, it uh, may prolong it uh, because it, uh, uh, it relieves people's stress and uh, people seem to uh, do a little better in terms of actual survival when palliative, palliatively sedated uh, rather than being allowed to, uh, to suffer. But this, this is kind of a complex construct as well. And there's huge potential for misperception of cause and effect. And uh, the goals of, of therapy for palliative sedation are really important to be communicated upfront to everybody, not just the patient who's often unable to participate in the decision making and in their substitute decision makers, their families, their loved ones, but also to our colleagues, our healthcare professionals who may not understand the subtleties of palliative sedation and may be actually quite uncomfortable with it. Um, so do make sure that you don't forget the healthcare professionals may not understand about palliative sedation if you're using it. There may not be a lot of time for education. So this is something to be uh, very proactive about. Next slide. So last days and hours with any condition, we have certain things that we like to do, like making sure that people have an opportunity to communicate with their loved ones. Uh, this is very challenging if, when the, there's a pandemic because of the res visitor restrictions. And a, a lot of different sites are reporting a variety of very creative ways of doing communication or allowing patients to spend some time with their loved ones, even if it's just on a screen. But things like having baby monitors that can be um, put in the room where the patient doesn't have to actually activate them. It's all very well if somebody can use a cell phone, but many patients are going to be too sick or not able to activate a cell phone. Um, encourage anticipatory legacy work as well. And uh, many of you uh, may be aware of already of Record Me Now, but this is a free uh, online app which um, can be downloaded. Um, it's been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times um, all over the world. And it allows patients to answer questions, just talking into the, the webcam of their device. Um, and the questions are evidence-based uh, from a, a group of 100 adults who'd been bereaved as children being asked what they would have liked to have known about their parent. And some of the questions are not the sort of things that people might think about naturally. Um, so they can be really good triggers. And if people say, oh, I, I don't want to do that because I don't know what to say, mm -hmm. if they use Record Me Now app, they can answer questions that uh, things like, when were you the most naughty? And you know, what were your favorite sports teams? And, and uh, those kinds of things, as well as the more um, serious topics. Uh, something that I've had uh, reported to me frequently is voicemails have, can be very reassuring people phoning um, people who have died on their old numbers and being able to listen to their voice answering the phone um, or replaying voicemails that have been left for them. These are the sort of things that only take a few seconds and can be really instrumental in reducing the dysfunctional grief after somebody's died, especially uh, in uh, an unexpected fashion. And then the last thing is the normal cultural and religious rituals that we are used to are going to have to be significantly modified. Um, funerals are now unable to be held with large groups. Um, they can be live streamed or they can be postponed. Um, there are certain religious uh, rituals as well, uh, like the last rites and things like that, which have to be done in a modified way. So just being aware that um, though it is all happening very quickly, we can still do things that are um, of cultural significance. We just have to do them in a different way. Next slide. So pre-arranging things with the funeral home is really important. Uh, making sure that you, things like the Edith forms, the expected death in the home forms uh, are, are there uh, so that the family aren't left not knowing what to do when, when somebody dies um, from COVID at home. Um, making sure that people are aware of the infection control issues around having a death from COVID in the community. Um, that's important. Uh, there was a report of a patient um, who died um, in Southeast Asia um, and a number of people got COVID from the body uh, at the funeral. Uh, so that you have to be careful with how the, the body is cared for after, um, after death and, um, and any risk to, uh, to bystanders. 
Um, and the, another thing which we shouldn't forget about um, is retrieval of unused meds. Um, we, because of the possibility of shortages of medications, we need to give small prescriptions at home. It's unlikely that people who are deteriorating from COVID at home will actually will last very long, to be honest. Um, and you don't want to give them huge prescriptions, especially of um, uh, potent opioids, sedatives. Uh, so it's important that those are retrieved from the home quickly, so to avoid diversion. And I mentioned already the live streaming and deferral of the uh, funeral. Next slide. Um, just going back to the hospital situation, if someone's in hospital and they die from COVID, uh, my understanding is that the ICU teams are now recommending that the ET tube is left in place when the patient is taken off the ventilator uh, and that reduces the exposure to staff. Um, and remembering that uh, we're all human and so are our colleagues and some of the people that are working on the front lines uh, in the ICUs are, um, are really struggling emotionally with not having opportunities to build up relationships with, with patients and the sheer volume of patients coming through, uh, not so much in, in BC, but in other parts of the world, um, is hugely traumatic, especially if they've been put in this situation to have to make the decision about whether somebody uh, is, uh, is discontinued from the ventilator or not, or whether they're ventilated or not in the first place. And so just being aware that uh, we are all human, um, take a moment for yourself uh, if a patient does die, just to ground yourself, relax, and uh, mark that experience uh, actually makes a big difference. Even if it's only 30 seconds, it's kind of like the minute silent, silence. It, it does make a difference to your ability to move on from a trust, stressful experience. And then later on, we have to remember that we are going to get through this at some point. And having group memorial services or events, I think are going to be important to start, um, start planning for. Uh, because uh, there's going to be significant accumulated grief amongst the healthcare providers from having to work in this uh, very difficult time. And, uh, and in order for us to all stay healthy, um, it's important that we support each other as well as possible. And memorial services have been shown to have a significant benefit. So that was um, the end of my section here. And so I'd like to pass over to Dave. Um, and uh, Dave doesn't have any slides, so we can just go into, we're just going to leave this um, this one up, I think, while we're talking, unless and we can go back to uh, just um, being able to see Dave speaking. Um, but um, Dave, perhaps you could give us um, some impression of what your experience has been so far with, with patients at uh, Lionsgate and St. Paul's. Uh, so, uh, so, thanks, so Pepper. thanks, Pepper. Ooh, I have a bad echo. I don't know why. One second here. I'm going to... Mute that. Have I still got an echo? Sound right to me. Okay, I'll great. mute myself. Okay. Uh, so for my first, I mean, my first trip back in the emergency room, I was scared because I admitted three presumptive COVID patients that all turned out to be positive in the first 60 minutes. And they were all uh, very, very sick, uh, needing admission. These weren't people who were in getting screened. And there are a couple of things that I, I noticed uh, right off the bat that I'm sure a lot of people have noticed as well is that they were um, more uh, hypoxic uh, than short of breath. And it, it was weird to see these people who should feel more short of breath and, and they didn't appear to be short of breath. Now, subsequently in that first shift, I saw someone who was younger, uh, more my age in, in the 40s, who was significantly short of breath to the point where we couldn't get on top of his symptoms. Uh, he ultimately didn't need to be intubated. Uh, he got away with uh, high flow nasal prongs and was discharged to the hospital, but he was a classic eight days into his illness um, and uh, came in very hypoxic and tachypnic and um, it was a bit of a balancing act. The other thing that struck me so far um, within that first week of seeing a lot of COVID patients or COVID suspect were uh, weird cases of delirium. So I felt very grateful for my palliative care uh, training because I felt more comfortable seeing patients who were very difficult to assist with their delirium symptoms. So whereas initially we would try something gentle like um, Halperidol sub-Q at a reasonable dose uh, rapidly escalated to requiring uh, methotrimepresine, which in the emergency room, in most emergency rooms, uh, is, is less familiar with a lot of people. Now, in our emergency room, it's actually 
very uh, commonly used and I've found that to be very helpful in trying to help people uh, with, with delirium so that they feel safe, um, less symptomatic, and we're actually able to care for them better. So uh, big vote for methyltrimeprazine, maybe at higher doses than I would normally use. Um, and then lastly, I found one thing that, again, I know there's been different webinars and lots of reading on uh, ketamine worries um, around shortages. So uh, we use a lot of ketamine in the emergency room for lots of different reasons we have for many years. And it's, it's for most jurisdictions, it's the drug of choice for um, a careful intubation for uh, getting people inducted for intubation. But we're using it for lots of different reasons, including for uh, dyspnea as well. But we have to be careful. You have to check your local hospital and pharmacy to know whether or not that's something that should be utilized uh, because it's, it's, there's some worry that it's going to be um, out of supply nationally or regionally. And we need to save it maybe more so for the critical care environments uh, outside of the emergency room. Um, so that's, that was my first little bit of experience, mostly in the emergency room. So I'm going to say thank you to Dr. Holly and Dr. Willis-Croft for your information so far. We have a couple of questions coming in. I'm, I'm taking the first one, though. Um, so Dr. Willis-Croft, what are you finding you're needing to use in terms of methyl um, trimeprazine doses? What, when you say you have to go higher than you're used to, what are you needing to use? Yeah, so th thank you. So, you know, normally starting maybe around 2.5 to 5 milligrams subcutaneously, uh, for, for patients who are more frail, um, going up to 10, 15 milligrams and greater sometimes um, is, is, and rapidly doing that to get on top of symptoms. And people are not getting overly sedated with this, um, but it is seeming to help. That's okay. sort of the dose range, yeah. That's actually the question that came in was, was on the same question. So uh, we've only got one showing up there on the Q&A, so I'm going to encourage people, we have 100 people on the call, to type in your questions to Dr. Holly and Dr. Willis-Croft now. And while they're coming in, I must say, um, I had a few things to ask you guys about. So Dr. Holly, you spoke about the sudden deterioration, that we, we, we should be preparing for maybe kind of an unprecedented kind of sudden deterioration. Are both of you seeing that? And what does it actually look like when you say sudden deterioration? Is it minutes, hours, and, and what do you notice? Well, I'm not, I'm not the one that's actually doing that, so I'm going to de, um, defer to Dave for his experience, but I have heard um, from other people who have, so I can, I'm happy to convey that secondhand information as well after Dave. Yeah, so the local experience is kind of ours, so people will go along a, a trajectory of having, um, you know, viral symptoms, but then in the course of hours, so for follow-up phone calls, for uh, public health, uh, follow-up that will routinely happen. People will be okay, but then hours later, um, they will decompensate quite quickly and become obtunded and quite hypoxic and, and need resuscitation. So it, it's, it, we're seeing hours. And then as most people have probably read, kind of seven to nine days uh, from the onset of symptoms. Okay, thank you. And then again on the question, oh, Dr. Holly, did you want to comment at all? That. Just that we have had a number of cases in Fraser Health and I spoke with one of the doctors that's looked after three of them and one person actually deteriorated so quickly they weren't able to even draw up meds. Wow. Uh, the patient basically just um, suddenly <laughs> and couldn't breathe and, and flooded lungs and, and just died um, and, and had been walking around the ward just on nasal prongs in the morning talking and chatting to people. So it, it can be very difficult. And that's why I, I worry a little bit if, if somebody is being told if they're symptomatic to stay at home and come to hospital if they get worse. Um, I would be very uncomfortable with that. Like if one of my family members was at day five and they were symptomatic and they were of you know, full code, um, I would want them to be monitored in the hospital because the chances of them getting to hospital in time would be pretty uh, remote. Do we have any data yet suggesting that the sudden deterioration is in a certain demographic? Is it tending to be the elderly or is it indiscriminate in terms of presentation like age the patients um, that uh, my colleague told me about in Fraser Health were actually young in uh, 40s 50s okay 
Interesting. So we have a question from Kathy to the panel. Um, so given this concern about medication shortages, um, are we currently looking at alternative routes like the good old fashioned per rectum morphine? Is that currently in play or is it just we're, we're thinking we might have to do that? Yep, I've, I've certainly made sure that people are aware that that is possible, but I don't know if people have got to the stage of actually having to use it yet. Dave, I think we're okay so far, aren't we? We, we haven't run out of anything yet. Uh, yeah, I, I feel very grateful for um, what's happened, at least uh, provincially for us in British Columbia. Uh, so I don't feel like we've had to do that. Although um, I, I think we do for things like anticonvulsants um, that we'll use, not anticonvulsants, but sedatives and benzodiazepines, we do have to maybe exercise our, our brain muscle a bit to be flexible around what we think we use. So I'm very comfortable and very happy with midazolam. Uh, because I use it every single day uh, with both jobs, usually. But um, getting more comfortable again with uh, different benzodiazepines, if you haven't used them in a long time, I think is important for dosing and roots. And if I can just say one thing on roots, and I know this is brought up by some of my other colleagues in emergency medicine and palliative care and other webinars, is that... Um, we really like intranasal uh, administration of medications at times. This is not a time to use uh, intranasal administration of ketamine, midazolam, uh, fentanyl, sufentanyl, because uh, there is a risk of, of having an aerosolizing generating procedure just by doing that. And so along the lines of things like fans for symptom management, uh, we discourage it. Um, and I think that's been brought up before in different webinars. Thank you. Now there's a question again back to the nose, Nan. So if it's not available or short supply, um, are you guys recommending using Haldol, which we would normally use anyways for delirium? Like where's that in your kind of your algorithm of use? Are you using it and would you recommend it if nose, Nan's not available? If I can just address this, I think that Haldol certainly in most emergency departments and in most wards would be more available than Nozanan. So I think being comfortable with our bigger doses of, of Haldol, um, I, I absolutely. And then as Pippa mentioned in the slide deck, uh, uh, benzodiazepines and knowing how to use them and, and uh, again, avoiding intranasal routes okay. with a COVID suspect. What's a bigger dose of haloperidol when you say a bigger dose? Uh, I mean, it could be, you know, 10 or greater to start milligrams and, mm -hmm. and going up. And I, I have had to use that only a couple of times in the last month. Uh, but, but, you know, yeah, I think just being open to needing more. And we're seeing that again with, with ketamine too. Uh, bigger doses that are uh, more dissociative um, and um, being comfortable with how to use that drug too. Okay. Yeah, I think and we, we both very, people need a lot of sedation. They, they need a lot of sedation and haloperidol is just not sedating enough. And that's what makes it a nice drug to use for treatment of delirium and for nausea because it's not that sedating. But in this situation, you actually want sedation. Gotcha. Then what's the indication for ketamine that you're seeing when it comes to COVID-19? When, when are you considering that? Yeah, sometimes a consideration of using it as a twofer because it can help with maybe arguably some bronchodilation or relief of dyspnea at the same time whereas a lot of these other medications won't have that property uh, in isolation. So, you know, sometimes I like to cheat and use a two for drug. Okay, fair enough. Um, there's a question again back to sort of the Haldol. So if you're in a care setting for delirium, um, now maybe I, I know the answer to this, but you maybe don't have Nozanan, and um, aside from Haldol, are you guys recommending going to the benzos at this point then? Like that would be in, like, that's a little bit different than we would use, we used to do. But would you say, okay, for this person asking the question, Amy, we don't have nose nan, aside from Haldol, would you recommend people go to the benzos? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it does go against the first principles, especially in the, you know, long-term care facilities and frail elderly and people who are more at risk for delirium. It does go against all that we preach uh, for avoiding delirium, but th this is a different experience for patients that we've been learning over the last several weeks we're learning on the fly as yeah. well okay fair enough so uh, there's a question here um from from valerie um so the, the idea of 
people who don't decline. Um, the question is, have you heard of patients who don't decline as quickly, uh, decline over days versus hours, you know, that rapid decline Dr. Holly just mentioned? Um, have you seen that? And is it a diagnostic indicator of anything? If someone is just declining over days versus hours, do we know anything about the outcome of those people? Pippa, can I okay. take this one? Yeah, please yeah. do. So um, th those are the, the, the case uh, examples where there's a really good um, role for obviously admission. So to Pippa's point earlier on, how she would feel anxious having a patient being monitored at home, either by themselves, by family, or by public health, by phone. Uh, those are the patients that, that really are success stories uh, sometimes by being in a monitored, dedicated COVID floor with physicians and other allied health and nurses who are comfortable watching for deterioration. And we have, I mean, we've just been, the simulations for preparing for these patients to decline have just been, I mean, it, we're just simulating all the time. It's, it's, it's great. So those patients, um, I, I've heard lots of good success stories and, and the numbers show that actually. Okay, fair enough. Now, Andrew's asked a question, of course, same scenario, but at home. So, you know, rapid decline, but in hospital, but like if you've got just a, sh like a tiny window of time to do something rapidly at home, any best guess of what you guys would say? R risk decline, severe symptomatology, but at home. What do you okay. bang in or what do you do? But is this for someone who is um, not to be going to the ICU and to have higher level of care? I'm assuming. I'm assuming this is somebody yeah. staying home. You know, I, I think that Pippa, like our, our UBC generated outline is a is a good one to look at in regards to it. It probably doesn't matter which opiate you use between morphine and hydromorphone if it's that precipitous a decline and you're expecting uh, maybe death within minutes to hours. Um, and it would be like the usual terminal care crisis orders would be an opiate and a benzo and, mm -hmm. and kind of just rapid um, and consistent reevaluation at the bedside. That, okay. that's, that's, and you know, our paramedics with the, the pre-hospital uh, courses we've been doing um, have, I think have helped open that up too, although it, it really depends on your jurisdiction and your ambulance organization and what access they have to medications. Fair enough. That is reinforced as well that opioids um, generally are really poor sedatives and people shouldn't rely on opioids alone. If people are anxious, distressed um, and, um, and really not doing well, especially if they're becoming confused because they're hypoxic, you want to sedate them. Um, the opioids are, you know, it could potentially even make things worse. If they're not that short of breath and they're not in a lot of pain, um, you may make them worse by adding some opioid toxicity in there. So um, sedation is probably a, a higher priority. If, you, if you've only got time to draw up one syringe or give one medication, I would probably go with a sedative first. But again, I don't have the clinical experience that Dave and some of my colleagues have. That, Thank you. That, yeah, that's really good advice. And just one last thing, just about being at home. I mean, some people have CPAP machines at home for sleep apnea and other reasons. And just, I think most people will know this, but just to reinforce that um, CPAP and BiPAP and high flow nasal prongs and nebulized medications should not be utilized in a suspect or proven COVID patient because they're aerosolizing and will expose everyone else around uh, to the virus. So things you may reach for as um, add-on therapies. Um, obviously, don't go to them, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Now, Nicola asked a question. She's, she's read a study about in Wuhan about clinical course and risk factors associated with mortality. The idea that um, I, I clotting is associated with the increased risk of death. So patients um, with the high and rising D-dimer didn't survive. Is that being checked anywhere, you guys? Is that routine business in emergency if people are quite symptomatic? What are you seeing? So we have a, a PPO, uh, pre-printed order set on our computer system around assessing people with um, suspect or proven COVID. D-dimer is actually in there. And I guess you just have to be thoughtful around how you're ordering that test because D-dimer obviously is uh, sensitive and not specific, and it can go up in uh, what we see in, in severe COVID cases. And then to Pippa's point earlier on, 
It can be seen in lots of different things like uh, these acute myocardial injuries, which can be anything from uh, myocarditis uh, to micro thrombi to macro thrombi and big saddle emboli. It's tricky. It's really tricky. And I honestly, I'm like a lot of people trying to learning on the go because uh, a lot of us are slow to use D-dimers because they're um, not proven to be as helpful at times. And I'm not sure I've totally found out the role for D-dimer. I know that trending D-dimers is being used in some centers, including the centers that I work at mm. for, with different practitioners. Um, but who do you send for a CT scan and who is well enough to go for a CT scan to reload a pulmonary embolus? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I do not have a great answer. Yeah, well, I'm sure that helps specify the modification for Nicola there with that question, but it's a moving, a moving, it's a good conversation to have as we can watch mm -hmm. all that. So they to, seem to clot more. That's, that's what we know. And, and it's just to what extent? Fair <laughs> depends enough. on the phenotype and stuff. all this other stuff. Yeah, my understanding, it was not helpful at, when you're, at the time when you're trying to decide whether to ventilate somebody or not. It's something which, you know, once they're on the ventilator, if it shoots up, then their prognosis is worse, but it doesn't help you with your decision making about whether to enter ventilate or not. It's, okay. it's not early enough. Okay, thank you, Dr. Holly. That's, that's a good discernment. Two questions I want to get to someone who's working in long term care saying, you know, is it just reasonable then given that you can't tell when someone will decline, they could decline rapidly. Do you, do you recommend just putting in proactively, getting the sub-Q butterfly lines in, like ahead of time, ahead of even needing any of these meds, just get, just get some butterflies in and ready to go and primed? I haven't actually seen that question before. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on what your resources are there. I mean, I think that the, the time to actually get medication in is usually going to the cupboard, getting it signed out, um, drawing it up and then getting it back to the patient. That's usually the bit that takes the time. I mean, they don't have to actually have a butterfly in. You can actually just inject it straight in. So if your nurses are comfortable doing sub-Q injections, I would probably say just to go ahead with an injection. Um, and then afterwards, once you've got the first dose in, then you'd have time to put in a butterfly if you need one. Fair enough. Dave, I don't know, how do you feel about that? No, I think that's a great answer. I, exactly. You don't need to have the butterfly in to get at least that first dose in. Mm -hmm. There is a quest to have the link to the UBC algorithm that you described, uh, um, Dr. Hawley. So um, I think we can probably arrange to get that sent out to people. Who yeah, well, actually, rather than having people remember links, because there's very always, you can never find them when you want them. Just Google UBC Division of Palliative Care, and it comes up straight away. Just click on it, and then you'll see on the top, um, in the, um, the banner across the top, there's in capital letters, Coronavirus. Just click on the coronavirus tab and it'll take you there because then, then you don't have to remember a specific link. Just UBC Division Perfect. of Power there. Go straight um, there. Now, I've managed to freeze. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I'm going to turn this over. I want to thank both of the panelists for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, no, I think Denise is frozen. Okay. Um, here's a, just to, to wrap things up. I just want to uh, I want to thank uh, doctors Holly Marshall and Williscroft for their time in preparing the content of the slides for taking time out of their very busy schedules to join us uh, today. Thank you so much on behalf of Pallium, and uh, thank you to all the people that participated on the webinar today as well for your thoughtful questions and comments. Uh, we had a very good discussion, and uh, as I mentioned right at the outset, this webinar is being taped. It'll be available on the website quite shortly, along with a synopsis of all the comments and, and responses that were given. So thank you again to, to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to do it. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Care. Thanks, Pippa. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Denise. Bye.